attack. It's not who you think he is. Are you coming? Is she okay? I'm wondering where uh, immortality came from, because for a player, there's this moment, this one moment that's like a flash of brilliance that everybody gets to discover. Was it like that for you as well? Did, did the game start with that moment where the curtain is pulled back and you get the story behind the story? I think there's probably like four or five different stories for where immortality came from. Because there's like a silly, perverse one where people kept calling the previous games interactive movies. Right, people would call her story an interactive movie, and as a movie buff, I'd be like, "No, they're not. It's not an interactive. It's not like a movie. Movies are different." And so there was an element of me that was like, "Ah, oh, screw it. I'll make an interactive movie then, right? Like I will make this about movies." So that was definitely there. There was, I had a couple of other projects that didn't happen. One time there was, uh, we were being asked to pitch for a Clive Barker game once. We'd made Silent Hill, and they're like, oh, could you do a Clive Barker Silent Hill? And we were like, sure, we could do that. And then when we told them how much money it would cost to make a Silent Hill game, they were like, oh, no. <laughs> so then I pitched them like, oh, what if there was a a lost retro Clive Barker game that was unfinished and was kind of haunted? Like, I've always been interested in the idea of kind of lost media or unfinished things and really interested with immortality. So certainly when it started to come together, that idea of who the character was was very was in there very early on. Um, there was a an archival interview that we pulled up as part of the research that was Olivia Hussey when she made Romeo and Juliet. So she was, I want to say, 15 years old, uh, and she's making the, the Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet, and she's being interviewed by this very stuffy BBC interviewer who is is and she's smoking because it's it's like the 60s. She's smoking throughout the interview. And at some point, the interviewer is like, whoa, as a, as a, to see a 15-year-old girl smoking, that's very strange and precocious. And she gives him this look like, dude, you have no idea what 15-year-old girl is getting up to. I mean, that that is pretty... There aren't many girls at 15, I know, that smoke cigarettes publicly. Oh, there are. But there's just something... I remember watching that interview and just this flash, there was a very momentary flash in her eyes where you really got a sense of, of, of there being a hidden strength that otherwise was you know, uh, being hidden. And so I watched like lots of these interviews of actresses being interviewed around that time. And even through the seventies and eighties, they were they were so often being like condescended to or packaged in a certain way that there was this kind of little wish fulfillment thing of like, oh, what if she could turn around and, and rip his head off? Or what if there was this hidden, you know, actually this is not the reality, there's something else behind it. Um, so that was definitely started to kind of coalesque as being uh, a key part of things early on. You talked uh, today on, in your uh, presentation uh, about uh, the FOMO that uh, players experience and uh, your need to, to let the players leave the story whenever they want. What are your thoughts on having like hours and hours and hours and hours of unseen video left for the players when they decide to, to leave immortality behind? There's probably a lot of stuff they haven't seen. So the way I see it, and like I've been having this discussion, so even back working on Silent Hill, we're making all this, the, these kind of narrative branches that are being chosen for the player. And the executives would be, they would go crazy. They'd be like, so we're spending all this money mocapping all this stuff that the player will never see. We, we have to tell the player it's there, right? And they would pitch us like, could you have picture in picture? So if something's happening, we show you what could have happened. And I'd be like, that's crazy. Because for me, the cool thing there is not that you don't see the stuff, but the thing you do see feels specific to you. So I think there's a, there's a sense of playing my games where people know that they're following their curiosity or they're, they're going down tracks that feel very particular to them, and then they find something cool. What I love is that sense of like, I bet no one else has seen this, right? Oh, and, and then going and telling your friends, and they haven't seen it, right? And that to me is so cool like finding these little pockets of interesting stuff, having your curiosity lead you places. And for that to work, the side effect is that there will be lots of things you haven't seen, right? So for me, it's much more about how do we create an experience where I can meaningfully discover cool shit uh, than, than kind of going, oh yeah, there's lots of things that that player hasn't seen. Which is why the, the FOMO thing troubles me because 
I want people to be able to walk away going, oh, this, this was such a cool personal experience I had. And that point where you're like, oh, I have to go back. And, and, and it's a thing that the older Zelda games, I would personally struggle with it, right? I would get to the end of a Zelda game. I would kill Ganon. And then I'd be like, oh, there's 20 more golden spiders for me to find. And I have to find them all because I love this game. And that experience of finding the last 10 golden spiders would be the experience of kind of slowly destroying the thing I loved. It would be hitting the edges of the world. It would be getting bored of backtracking through the same places. And what I loved when I played Breath of the Wild, they solved that problem. And their solution was very simply, this is just too much stuff, right? You, you get to the end of Breath of the Wild and unless you're uh, you know, uh, someone with a lot of time to spare, you, this, I'm never going to find all the Korok seeds. I'm never going to find everything. I'm going to, I remember seeing a review where someone didn't find like the beach town in Zelda till 70 hours in, right? And that idea that I love the idea that I can go and pick up Zelda on a rainy day and wander around and discover something I hadn't seen before. Um, but you know, so for me, that's the, the kind of the, the cool richness is, is feeling like, Oh, I could pick up immortality and this stuff that I hadn't discovered, or I could, there's still secrets for me to kind of pick away at. It's very telling as well that the reward for finding all the Korok seeds is a giant golden poo. Yeah, they go, <laughs> eh. We did that in, um, we kind of did that in her story in that there's, there's like one or two clips in her story that are the hardest to find. And, and the people that are 100 percenting it usually will kind of look at I've discovered all these clips and there's this gap. Oh, I've got to, I've got to get 100%. I have to find out what's in this gap. And it's a period of the story where she's using a lie detector. And so all she can say is yes or no, um, which is very hard to discover because of the word search mechanic. Um, but if, you, if you're clever and you infer that she's doing the lie detector, the, you can then search explicitly for just the word yes, and you can discover these clips. But the narrative reward is non-existent, right? It's like, this is the most boring... <laughs> These are the most boring clips in the whole game. It's just her stat there saying yes, no. Uh, so there was that was an intentionally kind of a way of saying to these people like, well done, you found everything. And we didn't quite give them a golden poop, but it was, you know, a, a similar kind of mindset of going, you're doing it wrong. You also uh, in the interviews and today as well uh, compared your games to to uh, the approach to uh, exploration and discovery to, to Breath of the Wild. Um, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, like I mean, when I played Zelda, when I played Zelda Breath of the Wild, it, I mean, it's obviously they're very different uh, mechanically and and in, in all sorts of ways. But it was the experience of playing that game. I felt like such a kinship with because there are so many open world games, and there's a lot of open world games that you know say you can go anywhere, and it's meaningless. It's like well, I could go to the west, the east, the north. I'm going to do the same thing and be climbing the same towers and doing the same cut and paste missions and everything. And there was something about Zelda where it felt like Nintendo were genuine in that promise. There was enough handcrafted material. There was enough, uh, you know, if I saw something up on a hill that looked interesting and I went over there, it would usually satisfy, it would be rewarding. There would be something interesting to find there. Um, so that, for me, like when you, you see, you know, all these open world games and then, Nintendo come in with Breath of the Wild and say, now we're going to actually make an open world game. And, and it seemed like there was such a genuine kind of engaging with the freedom being meaningful, um, with the, the traversal being meaningful, like, like walking through that world was the reward. Whereas a lot of open world games, it's like, well, I'm just going from A to B because there's a, a, a marker on my map at B, but you know, the, the stuff in between is meaningless. And I felt a real kinship with that of the way with my games i want to genuinely give people this freedom um it's not like fake it's not uh, you know when her story came out people were like is it secretly scripted like you t you can type anything technically but is there something clever going on i was like no no you i genuinely want you to type anything right and if you want to you could in her story type the thing that will get you to you know the end of the story kind of um but that isn't really the end of the story and it it, it doesn't break things right and that that genuine desire to give things over to the player uh the understanding that i think this was like a real kinship with zelda was when you look at breath of the wild you're putting so much more on the player because you're going we're not going to hold your hand 
Uh, yes, we're saying you can do anything, but that in itself is a big ask because now you have to decide what you want to do. Uh, and there's a real ask you know, for players that are used to being told, go here, do this. Uh, but the, the way it compensates is by being so generous with the content. Um, it, it's hard to not have a fun time in that game. And, and similarly with my games, it's like, look, we're going to drop you in, give you a little hand-holding, but we have to promise you that there's such an abundance and richness of content that as you're figuring things out, as you're kind of putting the pieces together, you're going to have a fun time. Um, so yeah, and then just like in game feel, I'm always referencing Nintendo because they, more than anyone really, like have an understanding and respect for the player. And, you know, they understand that the, the moment to moment should be expressive and fun. Uh, you look at like a Mario game uh, and, and what, where Mario is fun and a lot of platformers aren't is the, the point of Mario is here is a game that's saying th this game is about running and jumping and we're going to let you express yourself through that. So the fluidity of the controls, the kind of depth of the jumping mechanic and the levels they put you in you're expressing yourself through running and jumping. Like I used to, when my kid was little, I would let him play, I think it was Mario Galaxy. And he would just run around on the beach level, having a whale of a time. He didn't realize there was anything else you were supposed to do, right? Um, and I, I think for me, you know, somewhat uniquely in narrative games as well is me thinking about the game feel. Uh, and it's not just, you can't sort of wave away the game feel by saying, well, the narrative is interesting. And it's going, well, what is the moment to moment? How do we, you know, an immortality, we had this match cut mechanic. There was an early version of it where uh, any time whilst you were scrubbing, you could just click and it would do a match cut. And it, and it didn't feel magic enough. So then we we're like, okay, let's have it so that you have to enter a special mode. You're in match cut mode. And when you do that, there's a little bit of, of vignetting and a slight fisheye. And it's almost like you're in a sniper mode of a first person shooter. But we've got to like make that moment feel special and magical because we're, we're doing all this clever stuff behind the scenes, but we need you to really feel that when you're doing it. So we're constantly kind of looking at Nintendo stuff and going back to this idea of, you know, you get dropped in Zelda and you can run around and cut the grass and just running through the world has friction to it, feels interesting. Um, you know, those are kind of important touch things. Now, after um, leaving like the uh, AAA industry behind and starting your, your own company, you hit the run, uh, ground running. Uh, but it seems that every project you make, every game you make, is bigger in scope and scale, uh, which uh, leads me to ask, what's next for you? Uh, will it continue yeah. to balloon like uh, that? <laughs> it's a terrible path to be on, isn't it? Um, I kind of need to feel like I'm doing something exciting or different. Because um, certainly, like when her story came out, you say that was like a big hit out the gate. And uh, there were lots of people that were like, you should just make her story, like literally her story too, just a different person. And in fact, the people that played her story, they were like, oh, I want more of this. Just give me a different mystery, a different person in the seat. Um, but that felt too easy for me. Yeah, I think it's the the scale is an interesting question. Because um, certainly that that trajectory, we finished Immortality and it, and it did so well. And we had no idea, like up until the week before it came out, we were like, this could be Marmite. Like we, we're doing some things here, the way the match cut works that, that might turn people off could go either way um, but after the success of it it was like in fact we had a game we started thinking about that was very much like just continuing that arc I was like maybe we should put this on the shelf because it'd be very easy to immediately follow up Immortality with something that feels very much on that trajectory and because Immortality did so well it's like how could we <laughs> how could we top that uh, how you know people would would people just inherently be disappointed but also if we spend twice as much money as we did on immortality are we going to make half as much profit back like it's it's like a real interesting challenge to sort of figure out if you've arrived i guess there's a there's definitely a thing as well i've noticed where especially in narrative things and experimental narrative games people want to keep saying you've hit the formula right so like the, you saw this with telltale the Walking Dead was a big hit, so everyone was like, that's the formula. <laughs> Lock it in. We're going to do a hundred of these things. And that is feels like it, it, it kind of cuts off what could be a continued kind of exploration and evolution. And it's the same across all games, right? We're sort of still figuring out what even a video game should be. And 
I always get scared when people start to be like, this is it, this is the final version, right? We're locking it in. Uh, you know, when I was doing survival horror games, whether that was going this kind of classic survival horror mode, that's the, the template. And when we made Shattered Memories, we were like, actually, can we explore off to the side of this? Um, so we ended up, uh, yeah, we were working on two projects and, and actually we didn't stop ourselves from expanding the scope. Um, so we have one that is uh, building off of immortality, but we it's going in a really interesting direction. Um, mostly just like all the tech we built, we're using that, but it has, uh, I don't know, it might, might be one of the cooler mechanics we've come up with. I think people are gonna, when they hear what the game is, they'll be like, oh, oh, that's cool. Um, and then on the other hand, we're, we're making this 3D game, which is is really me doing what I preach, right? So I've done lots of these talks where I'm like, this is the stuff we're doing narratively with our weird FMV games. And everyone's like, well, this is really neat, but can I apply this to a third person action adventure? Uh, and so this is me going, well, no one has yet. So here's my vision for how we, we kind of radically transform a, a conventional character-driven action adventure Unreal 5 game. How nervous are you uh, about this project? <laughs> um, no, I'm, I mean, it's so cool. Like, we, we we know that the thing we're doing is, I'm like, I've never played anything like this. This is inherently awesome. Um, so that bit isn't nervous, and I, I, I'm kind of impatient to get to the bit when we finish the game and we can show people and get that reaction. Um, I guess there's a low-level nervousness of just like, oh, man, it's hard making a big ass 3D video game. Lots of stuff, lots of moving parts and everything. Um, I feel like we, we got to a really good kind of rhythm and approach to how you make games with immortality in terms of look, we, like a big thought, when, when I made Her Story, I was coming off, I'd done three years as the game director on a Legacy of Kane game that was was a very hard production. Uh, it's very big production, lots of involvement from publishers, uh, working at that level of kind of AAA, a lot of expectations around how mainstream it should be, and especially, you know, game mechanics-wise, right? Like, oh, this should be literally this percentage of combat gameplay, this much puzzles, this much, and the combat should work X, Y, Z. Um, and when I made Her Story, a, a lot of my kind of thoughts were coming off of what was painful on that game. And I was like, I want to create this system where I can spend a lot of time thinking and researching and putting things down on paper, um, which is always, you know, and people will say, well, that's very easy to do when you're making an FMV game. Because for the longest time, you know, these games are prototypes, and then we do the film shoot, and then poof, all the content goes in. So it's very easy to to give myself more thinking time. Uh, so with the 3D game, it's very much going, well, I still think we can do this. I think there's, uh, you know, there's a lot in traditional games where people make the excuse that you you won't know if it's fun until the very end. Right, famously, The Sims was only fun like the month before it shipped. And uh, there's lots of, of kind of pushing back decisions and being more exploratory uh, in a way that can sometimes be really useful, but I think is also very inefficient. If you have the level of control that I now get to kind of wield creatively, go, well, no, okay, we're going to do this differently. We're going to have this extended pre-production we're going to do all the thinking and, and some real crude prototyping so that we can actually lock in what this game is and then be a lot more efficient. It doesn't feel so risky despite the money involved and the scale of the project and, and the fact that this is like a, a, a full-blown 3D game because like I say, that we, we have such a, a cool core idea and everything we're doing is sort of proving out that this idea works. Yeah, I think it's just, it's just, it's going to be the point where you, uh, if, if in the marathon race, the point where just everything starts to hurt, right? There is that element to just the, the time it's going to take and the effort to make a, a proper 3D game that it will be uh, pushing through that. But I think people will be excited. It's uh, good and, and interesting as well to hear you talk about risk because there's a real trend now uh, for the big publishers, the big companies uh, for risk aversion. Uh, cuts, uh, the, the axe, a lot of projects. Yeah, it's. I think it's really hard because you look at, I don't know, it's, you look at Take-Two and they have GTA coming 
And that is a game that even the, the last GTA, probably on a given day, makes more money than any of the, you know, all of their indie games together would be a rounding error on the, the GTA DLC. So you can understand from that kind of giant corporate perspective, they look at their portfolio and it's like, oh, we got this really successful indie game that, that you know, made 5 million profit last year. They look at that and they're like, that's nothing. Like there's just, it's not, why do what, and they just wipe it off, right? And we've seen that all these projects and studios being shut down because they, they don't fit into that larger plan. But if you follow that logic through, and if the only game anyone is making or playing is Grand Theft Auto, then you're you're kind of just starving the industry of, of anything you know outside of GTA, and it and it's the same thing people talk about with movies, where you've you've seen the the kind of drop off of the middle the middle movie, right? It's like a giant blockbuster or a super cheap thing, and although on paper those those kind of middle budget movies are not bringing in 90% of your studio's profit. They are making the medium make sense. They are giving people, uh, you know, who've grown out of this big thing to, to find a movie that resonates with them. So it's so essential that we have that full breadth of expression in the medium that it's it's pretty gross to see it, it just be, you know, a, a quarterly financial decision to be like oh we're gonna cross that off that goes away it'd be nice to think like when we were doing immortality i was doing lots of research into the history of movies and uh and, and where the various periods of movie making had, had changed and there's like a really interesting period after the second world war where so much of europe had been destroyed uh you'd obviously had a lot of the the core movie talent in germany had, had, had left or been exiled um and there was this incredible kind of resurgence of very entrepreneurial people who were, you know, stepping into the, the the rubble of Europe and being like, this is my chance to actually build things quickly and from the ground up. And, you know, all the people who emigrated to the United States basically, you know, created so much the value in the film industry there. So there's there's always, it's like, it's very easy to see in these kind of cyclical economic things that like this level of devastation hopefully will see an interesting kind of resurgence of interesting things but it's definitely yeah this one feels pretty pretty bad um and you know it, it is all happening at the same time that we worry about discoverability and just the abundance of content there's so much television and film and everything going on that uh you know when her story came out it had weeks if not months where it was still on the page on steam where all the gaming forums it was there were still threads at the top where people were playing it and discussing theories like that you know for a, a small game like her story that didn't have any marketing the buzz kept it going for like a good couple of months um but i think that was like the end of this golden era where now a cool indie game will come out it could have buzz for two days and then swallowed up and then boom Hades is out and then boom this other thing's out and then boom, big new TV show uh, so I think that's like the biggest kind of ex existential threat is how do you sort of fit in to that ecosystem all I try and do is uh, make something that I've not played before in the knowledge that then there will be an audience out there that this is the thing they really want to play they didn't they might not know it right which is the hard bit but um you know, I could I could be trying to chase the trends or make something that's a clone. And that might, in some cases, be more lucrative. But for me, it's like, no, I want to make something that people play it. And in a couple of years, if someone's like, hey, did you play Immortality? Be like, yeah, and it's still there. I remember this game, right? There are games I've played that go in and they're, they're fun in the moment, but they don't necessarily stick in your mind. Um, and, you know, for me, that's the, the goal. Well, I, me for one, is grateful that you feel that way. <laughs> Just uh, finally, uh, when can, can we expect to hear more about your next two projects? Uh, it's all very hush hush. Um, yeah, we have extremely cryptic Steam pages for Project C and Project D are the two projects uh, we are hiring currently for them. So we are like, we have to at least admit they exist. Um, and. 
And you may hear some information <laughs> at some point this year. We'll, we'll reveal some little bits. Um, but, you know, hang in there. Hang in there. It'll be worth it when we show some stuff. God, let's be in the mood. Was that enough? You were a goddess. <laughs>